Today, we're going to be going over something that has been long requested and often requested, a step-by-step -step leveling guide for new players, for veterans, for anybody that's creating a new character and is wondering what order they should do things in and what things they need to make sure they don't forget, what things you need to make sure you're doing between 1 and 10, between 10 and 45, between 45 and 50, and 50 and 160. If you do these things in the order that I mentioned, all of these various forms of progression are going to happen passively while you're playing the game because you took the time early on to pick them up. And that way, when you need that type of currency, whether it's transmutes or undaunted keys, when you hit 160, you'll have them ready to go. You'll be able to craft those amazing sets that are going to make your character really shine. So let's get into it. So let's start right at the beginning. You've created your character and it's either going to drop you in the newest chapter that you own, or if you choose to go through the tutorial, it's going to end up dumping you into a room full of portals, at which point you'll be able to choose which zone you want to start in by clicking on the portal associated with that zone. Whether you want to go to Somerset or Morrowinds or even Western Skyrim, it's going to let you choose. But I'm going to propose something even a little bit different still. Rather than going straight to one of these zones and doing that zone story, let's do something else first. Actually, a few something else's that are going to be really beneficial to have unlocked. But before I get into that, let me just briefly touch on how zone stories work in Elder Scrolls Online. In Elder Scrolls Online, there's a main story quest. And then on top of that, there's a zone story quest for every single zone in the game. Each one of these zones that I'm hovering over has its own compartmentalized story associated with it. You can go there at any time and run through the story and experience the lore associated with that zone. And the order that you do them in isn't terribly important. However, there there are some benefits to doing them in order or at least in the order that they were released because you do meet characters on the beginner islands that transition into some of the faction zones that will later even end up in some of the expansion DLC content. And if you met them early on, they're going to be more meaningful when you bump into them later. You're going to have that relationship and you might even have some extra dialogue options. These dialogue options aren't going to result in better rewards or even loot that you wouldn't have otherwise got. They're purely just different ways of handling the same conversation. They might reminisce on your past experiences together, or it might be a little easier to get them to trust you because you've done something together in a past zone. You can either do these zones out of order or in order. That's completely independent of what I'm about to tell you. And I'll give you a link to doing the zones in order. It'll show you which zone you should start in and which zone you should go from there and from there and from there. It's a nice little guide for those that are interested in soaking up the lore one zone at a time in the order that it was intended. For this guide, though, we're going to start even a step before that before you start questing and before you start doing zone stories let's back up one second all right so you've created your character you're dropped into the world you're going to very quickly get three skill points you're going to want to put one point in each skill line every class has three skill lines go ahead and put one point into the first skill of each line and then put those on your front bar which is going to be your only bar until you're level 15. later on you'll unlock a second bar we won't get into that much right now i'll put more in-depth links into building your character in the guide below that's a separate video from what we're talking about here. The important thing to know is you want to leave at least one skill from each of these lines on your bar until that skill line reaches level 50. In other words, until that skill line is maxed out. These skill lines are only going to level if you have a skill on the bar from that line. So siphoning will only level if I have one of these five skills on the bar. It doesn't have to be the first skill. If you unlock another skill later on that's more interesting to you, you can take this one off and then you can put this one on instead. It's no different. But for now, these are the only three we have unlocked. So these are the three we're going to put on our bar. We're also going to unlock a weapon skill line. Weapons will level up as long as you have them equipped while you're killing things. So you can open up your adventurer's box and you can grab the staff if you want to level up a mage or you can leave the two-hander equipped if you have that equipped. I want this character to be a magtoon and I want to use magic abilities. So I want my staff out and I want to unlock that line. In order to unlock the staff skill line, I just need to kill something with my staff out. So I'm going to go kill a wolf here real quick with the staff out. There's two of them, so we're going to have to end both of them. That's okay. All right. There we go. We unlocked the staff. We actually leveled up a couple of abilities as well. Now we have the staff here because we killed something with a staff equipped. That's all you have to do to unlock a skill line, whether it's armor. If you want to unlock an armor skill line, you have to wear three pieces of that weight of armor. So if you want to wear medium on a stamina tune, you got to wear three pieces of medium to unlock that line. The more pieces you're wearing, the faster that line will level. Same thing with the destruction staff or any weapon line. The more of these abilities you have on your bar, the faster this will level, which means the faster you'll unlock the passives and the faster your character will start to get stronger. However, it's a balancing act, right? Because you 
you want to level up your class skill lines as well. So you want to leave at least one ability from each of these lines on your bar so that all three of your class lines get to 50 so that you can tap into all of your class passives in all three lines. Elder Scrolls Online is a game where you are made stronger by the sheer number of passives that you're unlocking. No one passive is going to turn you into a god, but the sum of all of the passives ends up having quite a huge impact on your overall strength. So you want to tap into as many as you can and get them on your character. Okay, now that we've got our weapon and we've got our weapon equipped, we've got a skill line unlocked, we've got one ability from each of these bars on. And the next thing I'm going to do is the less obvious thing. This is what I would do that a version of me that hadn't played the game yet would have no idea I should start off by doing. And that is grab my companion. And the reason for that is your companion is going to level alongside you, but only if you went and unlocked your companions first. And they're also going to get gear. When you open a chest, every time you open a chest, there's a chance that there will be companion gear in there. And companion gear is pretty hard to come by, especially good companion gear. So the sooner you get your companion and have it alongside you while you're playing, the sooner it's going to be leveled up, the sooner it's going to be fully kitted out with good gear, right? So you want to go ahead and grab that companion right away. Not to mention, they're fun to have around. They have personality. They comment on things you do. And that leads us to the next question. Right now, there's six companions in the game with two more being added later this year. So of those six, there is a definite community favorite, and that's going to be Ember. Ember can be found right here in Tordryak. You go to Tordryak, you'll see her standing out there, do her quest. It will unlock her. It takes maybe five to 10 minutes to knock that quest out very quick. The reason Ember is a community favorite is because she's the cat with the personality of a golden retriever. I mean, no matter what you want to do, she thinks it's the best idea ever. She is there for it. She gets excited about every little thing, right? She's just a good vibe when you're playing the game. Now, you can't upset her if you get caught doing crime, right? She's okay with you doing crime, which a lot of companions aren't. It's going to negatively impact your rapport with them. And if you get good rapport with them, it unlocks benefits, it unlocks passives and things like that that are really nice to have. And so the rapport system and being able to max out your rapport with a companion is important. And because she loves so much and she dislikes so little, she's also happens to be one of the easiest companions to max out your rapport with. So for all of those reasons, she ends up being the community favorite. And again, if you want to get her, grab her at Tordrow. And if you don't have High Isle, but you do have Blackwood, you can come here and you can grab either Miri at the Doom Vault Volpinas up here, or you could come down here and grab Bastion at Deep Scorn Hollow. These two are probably the most picky of the companions because they were the first two. These are the two that were made. And then the devs learned like, oh, people don't like it when the companions are complaining all the time. So every companion they made after these two complains a lot less, likes a lot more. It gets along with you a lot easier. And then there's the two companions that were added with Necrom. You can find one right outside of town here in the Telvanni Peninsula. That's going to be Sharp as Night. He's like the Jason Bourne-esque one. He forgot his memory. He's a really cool character. He's a pretty cool vibe to have around. And then last but not least, you've got in Apocrypha here, right in this town here, you can go and grab Azendar. He's kind of your crazy uncle type of figure. He's an Arcanist and he might be missing a few Marvels. You know, he's, he's a little bit all over the place. So those are also great companions to grab. Ultimately, you can grab all of them and you can unlock all of their passives. And that's something you're probably going to want to do in the long term. But in the short term, it's never a bad idea to just grab one right away and make sure you have it out with you while you're exploring. If you don't come into your companion menu right here, come into your collections menu. You can find that at the top right here, collections, and then click allies, companions, and make sure you pull out the companion you want to level up first. If they are not out and by your side, they are not getting experience and they are not getting gear, right? If they're just tucked away in your menu system somewhere and you don't have them actually physically present, they're not going to be leveling with you. So be sure to slot them on your quick slot wheel and then be sure to pull them out. Another thing to be aware of is when you talk to your companion and you go to your companion, menu, you'll notice that they have skills and their skill lines are going to have guilt. Right, we have Fighter Guild, Mage Guild, and Daunted Guild. And in order to level these up and unlock the skills at the bottom, you have to do dailies for each of these guilds with the companion out when you turn the daily in. So when you do a Fighter Guild daily, when you do a Mage Guild daily, when you do an Undaunted Guild daily, make sure that you pull your companion out before you go and talk to the NPC so that your companion gets credit for it and you level up their guilds as well. So now that you've got your companion of choice, the next thing I'm going to say to do is head to Western Skyrim. So you're going to teleport to the Solitude Docks Way Shrine right here. It's the only one you're going to have unlocked right now. So head over to the nearest Way Shrine. After you grab your companion, right click on the map to zoom out, then click on Western Skyrim and click on the Way Shrine 
over there. But first, let me tell you about the highly anticipated next entry into the Yakuza series. Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth is coming to PlayStation, Xbox, Windows, and Steam on January 26th. Link down in the description. Experience one-of-a-kind combat with dynamic, fast-paced RPG battles where the battlefield becomes your weapon and anything goes. Stop into Allo Happy Tours and Waikiki to go for a tour and unlock new jobs. Jobs in Infinite Wealth are like classes in other RPGs, allowing you to tie up bad guys with your lasso as a desperado. Sweep the floor with hooligans as a housekeeper or slice down foes as a samurai. In this game, two larger than life heroes are brought together by the hand of fate and team up to explore Japan and all that Hawaii has to offer. This time around, combat is more strategic and dynamic than ever before. You can target your enemy's weaknesses and use the environment against them. Powerful area of effect attacks have never felt so good. Stack up your enemies and knock them all down or throw your enemies into explosive gas canisters to amp up the damage even more. If you time your attacks just right, you get rewarded with perfect attacks for massive damage. But what if you find yourself facing off against unworthy opponents? Just give them the smackdown. If that's not an option, summon your Poundmates, a powerful group of allies for hire with a wide range of abilities to help you in battle. So what are you waiting for? If you pre-order now, you get the Heroes Booster Pack and a special job set. Play Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth on PlayStation, Xbox, Windows, and Steam by clicking the link in the description. Massive thank you to Sega for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thanks so much for listening. Now let's get back to the video. Now that you're in Skyrim with your companion, let's go ahead and run up into the town of Solitude. You're gonna spawn here, you're gonna follow this path and run up into town. All right, once you get into the town of Solitude, go ahead and grab this way shrine on your way over here to the Antiquarian Circle. This is what we came here for. This is going to unlock the Antiquities Guild, which is going to allow us to scry and excavate things such as treasure, which we're gonna be able to sell for a lot of gold, or mythic items, which we're going to be able to equip and make our character a lot stronger, or even furniture for our house. So we unlocked the way shrine by walking close to it, and then we run over here to the Antiquarian Guild, which will be behind this door right here. If we look at the door, it says Antiquarian Circle. We come inside and this lady right here, Verita Numita, is going to give us the guild. She's gonna give you a little mini quest to do that basically is just a tutorial on how to use this sucker right here, the Antiquarian's Eye. I have a guide on how to do scrying and excavating. I'll link that in the description below as well in case you don't know how to do this. But essentially, once you pick it up and you talk to her again, the skill line has now been unlocked. She's going to send you downstairs to go scry your very first antiquity. This lady is going to explain she needs your help. You're going to open up your scry menu by pressing J if you're on PC or clicking this little book right here if you're on console. And we're going to do Gabriel's bottle of proving, which is going to teach us how to scry and excavate. I'll link the in-depth guide in the description below. This is a very simplified version. This is the tutorial. They're going to get a lot harder than this, but basically what you want to do is connect this one here that's touching this foci, as they call it, and you want to get from here to here by filling in these squares. So you're just going to touch them, fill it up, boom, scrying foci. We did it. Now, if you successfully scry it, it's going to reveal the location on your map. See the blue circle there? That means that we need to go here and excavate. So that's just outside the door conveniently for this little tutorial. We step outside. Now you're going to want to do something very important. This is something that a lot of people forget to do. They forget to slot the eye on their quick slot wheel. So many people level this up without doing this. And these, this little treasure right here can be very difficult to find because sometimes this blue circle will be massive, right? It'll be huge and it'll be out here in the wilderness. And you'll have to go there and look for this little pile hidden amongst the brush or next to a stream. And here's a really easy way to do that. Open up your inventory. Go to your quick slot menu, click on tools, and the eye is there. You're going to drag this onto your wheel. Now that that's there, you can hold Q down on PC or your potion button if you're on console, and you can select this item with your mouse. Now that that's selected, press the quick slot button, which is Q, and it's going to point towards the treasure. I used it right on top of it, so it's basically pointing straight ahead. If I would have used it over here, it would have pointed at that right there. Now on this tiny little site, this isn't needed or even useful. 
But when you get to the massive sides out here, this is going to be critical in doing these efficiently. So don't overlook this very important step. Get this thing slotted on your quick slot wheel and then use it whenever you need to. You can also put things on this wheel like food and potions, which you absolutely should do. Now we're going to excavate it. Again, the scrying and excavating guide is linked in the description below. But basically what you want to do is use this tool here as your hot and cold sensor and use this tool here to uncover it. So we're going to do this. All right, this says it's far away from this side and it's closer to this side, which means it's probably like right here. And there it is, right? Because these are orange, these are yellow. So we knew going this direction, we're getting closer. If these would have been orange, the bottom three, the right two and the bottom one right here, you would have known it was up here in the left, right? You kind of just use like the hot and cold, right? So if you go from here, you're getting warmer and it's, it's over here somewhere. Now we know where it's at. We have four of these left, so we can pinpoint the location a little more. Okay, so we know it's like, uh, it's roughly a rectangle in this area right here. More often than not, it's gonna be a rectangle of some sort, either going left to right or top to bottom. Sometimes for higher level scries, it will go diagonally. Now we're gonna use the brush. You have a time duration up here which isn't actually linked to real time. It's just that every time you take a turn with your brush, it's gonna eat some of this time until it runs out and you failed the scry. We're just gonna go ahead and dig. This is a very easy one because it's a tutorial. And there it is. We uncovered the antiquity. Easy, right? Now, there's bonus treasures hidden in this table somewhere. The more dirt you uncover, the more likely you are to discover the bonus treasures that sell for a little additional gold. So start with the shallow areas and hope that you find the treasure. Again, I have a written guide that goes into great detail and a video guide that are linked in the description below. Go refer to that for a much more thorough guide. Um, this one is gonna be more topical just to kind of keep this going along so we can move on to the next topic. But once you get into scrying and excavating, check out those guides. They're gonna be essential for maximizing your gains on these systems. All right, we'll turn in the quests. Okay, now we've got our companion from Blackwood. We've got scrying and excavating from the Skyrim expansion. The next one that I would consider getting is the Sigic Guild for a couple of reasons. One, if you're a magic attune, if you're going to be a mage, it's got some really nice skills that are very powerful and very useful to have on magic attunes. Now, if you're not a magic attune, it's still useful to get at least level one of the Sigic Guild because that's going to unlock the Sigic Troves, which are these loot bundles that you can only see if you have level one Sigic Guild unlocked. You will not be able to see these until you unlock it. They're one of the most lucrative nodes in the game that you can open up. To unlock the Sigic Guild, what you're going to do is zoom out on the map and we're going to look at Somerset and we would click on the Shimmering Way Shrine and travel there. Once you land at the Shimmering Way Shrine, the quest basically presents itself to you. This guy right here has the main story quest for Somerset. And in order to unlock the Sigic Guild, you have to do the first quest for the main story quest until it takes you to the zone of Arteum. So you'll just follow this quest until it eventually takes you to this zone here. Once here, you'll go into this building, you go down a portal and there'll be an NPC inside with a quest for you. If you pick that up, it will be the quest to unlock the Sigic Guild. I will put a link in the description for the full step-by-step -step guide on how to unlock and level up the Sigic Guild for your convenience. Okay, now you have your companion, you have scrying and excavating, you have the Sigic Guild, I would also pick up the Mages Guild and the Fighters Guild and the Undaunted Guilds. So we're going to teleport to a base game zone that everybody has access to. And again, if you don't have access to any of these zones or any of these items that I'm talking about, that's OK. None of these are required. They're very useful to have if you do have access to them. But if you don't have access to them, it's not the end of the world. If you don't have access to any of those chapters, you will have access to this next step. Everybody can do this. This is base game content. Now we're going to zoom out on the map and we're going to go to Daggerfall Way Shrine up here. Now, once you land here, if you haven't already talked to the hooded figure, they will appear to you this person right here. See how they're called the hooded figure? If you interact with this person, you're going to pick up the main story quest. If we look right now at our journal, it says talk to the hooded figure, the main story quest. This just popped up here. So we'll talk to them. It is worth doing the main story quest. There's about 10 or 12 skill points that you'll get from the main story quest. So it can be beneficial to do that. All right. So my character is a Khajiit. So technically it's in the Aldemary Dominion. So I've come here to unlock the Finder's Guild and the Mage's Guild. Okay, so we're going to head into the Fighters Guild. 
and inside you'll be able to find your fighter's guild representative go ahead and talk to him he's going to tell you about the guild you can spam through it if you'd like or listen to the lore and at the end of it he's going to give you the fighter's guild skill line so now that you've gone to the major skill, grab that skill line and come here to the fighter skill and grab that skill line, you will have both the fighter skill and the major skill unlocked. If you're going to be doing a lot of questing, definitely consider picking up intimidating presence and persuasive will. These passives will allow you to unlock dialogue options that you wouldn't have otherwise had to get the NPC to do whatever it is you're trying to get done. If you don't have these unlocked, you can still get to that same end, but you're probably going to have to do some kind of a little fetch quest for them or some menial tasks that they would like you to do in return for their information. Okay, now all of the prep work is done. We've got our companion. Make sure you summon your companion if it ever is unsummoned simply by going into your collections menu, this button right here go to companions and then summon the companion that you would like to have out make sure they're out with you at all times remember they don't level up and they don't get gear unless you have them out while you're doing your adventuring so now you've got your companion out you've got your skill lines unlocked you've got antiquities unlocked so now when you find leads you'll be able to actually dig them out of the ground scrying and excavating are going to eat a ton of your skill points early on you're going to be very skill point starved feel free to run out and collect sky shards around the maps you can go to one map you can go to multiple maps exploring and grabbing sky shards every three of these sky shards that you grab is going to give you an additional skill point as well as doing the main story that you picked up that's going to give you 10 to 12 if you want to work your way through that another thing that you can grab and this one is completely optional because it's very rp based but it does have some nice rewards tied into it and if you're someone that enjoys card games this could be a lot of fun so you'll want to come to high isle if you have access to high isle and then come to the ganfallon bay and then in here you're going to want to come down and head to the ganfallon gaming hall this is where you can pick up tales of tribute it's a card game that you can learn and you can challenge nbc all over the game to card game duels and get all kinds of different rewards and collect all kinds of different cards throughout the game in the process of doing everything else. So, so if this sounds like something that you would enjoy, then definitely swing by and pick up Tales of Tribute so that you can be finding all the cards that are scattered throughout the game. The very next thing I would do is get add-ons. I'll link my add-ons video in the description below. That's going to give you all of the essential add-ons I would start with, as well as at the end of the video, I explain how to install the program called Minion that is going to be essential in managing those add-ons for you. And here's why I would get the add-ons first thing. Not only do they provide a ton of quality of life upgrades and improve the UI, some of these add-ons aren't just quality of life. Some of them objectively make the game better. So I really encourage you to grab the add-ons sooner than later. Don't be afraid of add-ons because once you have Minion installed, it's really easy to install them. All you do is search for the add-on you want, like map pins, and then click the install button right here. Boom, your add-on is installed. And once you get the associated lib files, it'll be up and running. I have a complete install guide. I'll link that in the description below so that you don't have to go searching for it. Just know that grabbing your add-ons is one of the first things that you should do. And I'll explain why real quick right now. Add-ons aren't required. However, they do add a lot of quality of life that if you value your time will be really important to you. This map is littered with sky shards. Every three sky shards you collect is going to give you one skill point. So you're going to be running around questing and you will very frequently run right by a sky shard and not know it, missing the opportunity to collect it. And then later on, you're going to come back and look for them or you're going to look it up online, probably on a website, or you're finally going to cave and get the add-on so that you can find them. If you have have the add-on installed however while you're playing the game you'll notice oh look i'm literally standing on the sky shard now you spawned right here if you started in blackwood and there's no way you would have known that this sky shard was up here and you probably would have missed it and you would have been running around and you would have had to backtrack here you know waste a bunch of time coming back to the spot you've already been to grab the sky shard that was kind of just tucked right there there it is. If we run up this hill, we'll go grab it, right? And so this add-on is very handy. It's going to let you know when you're near something important like that. So you can pick it up while you're there, as opposed to having to make another journey back to that location to grab it. This is just one example of how incredibly useful add-ons can be. The same is said for lore books, which are essential for leveling up your mages guild line. We can turn that on. And anytime we're near a lore book, which are even harder to notice, we can pick them up. Otherwise, you'll be running back, spending a lot of time running over areas you've already been to to grab something that you already stood next to 
and just didn't see. So if you're on PC, definitely consider getting add-ons first thing. But right now is the time at which you kind of get to choose the path that you take in this game, what you want to focus on, right? You've unlocked your scrying and excavating. You've got all your guilds, so these can level up now. When you find lore books, this will level up. Whenever you destroy a dark anchor or kill Daedra, your fighter guild is going to passively level up. When you get to the point where you're doing dungeons at level 10, we're going to get into that next. This is going to level up your undaunted guild. So if you went and did these straight away like I did, you're only going to be level three or four. And that's just experience that you got on your way to this point, basically by unlocking new locations. Now you're free to do whatever you want. You've got all of the best skill lines and the companions unlocked from the newest chapters in the game. And those are going to level with you as you level through the base game content or whichever chapter zone you want to go to. If you want to go to Skyrim, you can now go to Skyrim and you can pick up the zone story here. Simply to do the zone story in Skyrim, all you have to do is click on the zone of Skyrim's map and then click open zone guide and then say start zone story and the map is going to zoom in and it's going to show you where you would go to pick up the zone story so you'd go back to this solitude docks way shrine that we went to earlier and you'd pick up the quest from the guy right here it's on your map marked there so you can get that started and from here or whichever zone you decide to go to You'll follow that quest throughout the map. You'll pick up side quests and do whatever you want to do. Whatever's fun to you. Honestly, there is no right or wrong way to play this game. You've got all of the essentials already. We went and picked them up right off the bat so that you can't miss any of them. So go forth and have fun. OK, now fast forward to level 10. You hit level 10. What should you do now? The first thing you should do when you hit level 10 is queue up for a dungeon. I'm going to switch characters now to a character that has dungeon unlocked. All right, now we're on my higher level character. This is my main and we're we're well over level 10, right? So we have access to the things that you would start doing at level 10, one of which would be to open up the group menu here by pressing P on your keyboard or navigate to it if you're on console and choose dungeon finder. Under this, you'll see random normal dungeon here and it's going to tell you your reward premium undaunted exploration supplies this is going to give you things like transmute crystals those are essential for the progression of your account and for crafting gear and after this guide's over while you're playing through the game i highly suggest maybe listening to my complete beginner guide in the background Maybe just listen to it while you're playing, while you're going through the zones and questing or the dungeons and try to absorb all of the knowledge about all these other systems in the game passively, perhaps, so that you can better understand why we're doing things like these dailies to get both the experience and the transmute crystals. You can do one daily dungeon every 20 hours. This has a 20 hour cooldown, so it basically works out to once a day. Same thing with the battlegrounds. This is the PVP daily. You can do this once a day. It's going to give you the same amount of experience. If you're 50 or above, it's going to give you 100,000 experience. If you're below 50, it's going to scale backwards. At level 50 and above, 100,000, uh, less than 50, it's, it's going to give you less than that. But it's scaling with the amount of XP required to level. So even though it's a smaller number, you're still getting a ton of XP for your level. You will still go from level 10 to level 13 in one dungeon, right? Just one quick dungeon. You're going to get a few levels because of this giant boost in XP. Very much worth doing your daily dungeon. Dungeons, if we look at the dungeon list here, so here are all of the dungeons in the game that you can do on normal. You can get one skill point from each dungeon. There's a quest in every single one of these dungeons. You can do the quest one time. And when you turn in the quest at the end of the dungeon, it gives you a skill point and another boost of XP. So doing a dungeon for the first time is very productive for both your skill point gains, but also your XP gains. Also, dungeons are one of the best ways to just get tons and tons of gear rained down onto your account. Now, the gear that you get as you're leveling up is all going to be hot garbage, right? It's low level. Nobody wants it. I promise you there's very few exceptions to that. There are a few pieces of valuable gear. None of that is going to come from dungeons. So any gear that you find in these dungeons, you're going to do one of two things with it as you're leveling up. You're either going to equip it if you don't have any gear in that slot already, or you're going to take it to a bench a crafting bench and you're going to deconstruct it crafting benches exist all over the game you'll look for a symbol like this in one of the zones and it's going to say alchemy station blacksmithing station clothing station cooking fire and chanty table right you'll be able to go to those crafting stations the woodworking the blacksmithing and the clothing station and you'll be able to deconstruct the gear you get from the dungeons, from the delves, from the overland content that you do. Basically, that is how you level up those benches. You take the things that you find to those benches and you deconstruct it. Don't feel bad about deconstructing gear. It's giving you materials that you're gonna use to craft and upgrade 
good gear later on. So these materials aren't for nothing. You're going to use these later and it's leveling up your crafting benches, right? So a lot of good comes from running these dungeons. You're getting gear rained on you that you deconstruct. That's going to level up your crafting benches. You're getting transmutes that you use to craft gear later in the reward cache for doing your daily. You get tons of experience. You become a better player because you learn how to play through dungeons and play through group content and you get the bonus XP for doing it once a day. You can run as many dungeons as you want in a day, but you only get the random normal bonus when you queue up for random normal the first time you do it that day. It is useful to do specific dungeons. Just know that when you do a specific dungeon, you won't get this XP boost. So don't do a specific dungeon until you've done the daily random. Then you can queue up for a specific dungeon. Um, maybe look for one that you've never done before so that you can get the skill point and the undaunted experience, which brings us to the undaunted guild. Now that you're level 10 and you're entering dungeons, you're going to begin earning achievements inside of those dungeons. Achievements in dungeons are how you level up the undaunted guild, or at least it's part of how you level up the Undaunted Guild. Running through a dungeon, completing the dungeon, killing a certain number of mobs in that type of dungeon, right? There's all these little achievements and the Undaunted Guild will slowly but surely level each time you earn one of those achievements. This is important because these Undaunted passives are pretty much essential for every single build in this game. So you want to level the Undaunted Guild, you want to run these dungeons and you want to get those achievements. One other very important thing happens at level 10. You unlock a mount. Now your character can zoom around on a mount. Well, He's not going to be doing a lot of zooming just yet. Uh, when you first get your mount, he's very slow. One of the things you need to do is go to the stable master. If we hover over this icon here, you see the little horse and it says stable master next to it. Or if you were in a different town and you look at the map in town, let's look at, for instance, Vivek, you'll see a horse on the map and it says Stable Master, and you just go talk to the Stable Master. All right, so let's go talk to the Stable Master so you see what that looks like. All right, you talk to him. Open up the menu. You've got three options. You're always going to choose feed first. This is very important. There's only about two things you're going to spend gold on as you level up. This is one and I'll get into the other one next. But when you're leveling up, so this is another thing you can do once a day. Come here and you can upgrade your mount speed. Typically, people will follow that up with carry capacity. This is going to increase your inventory size. And then finally, they'll get stamina. There's an argument to be made for getting stamina before carry capacity if you plan on spending all of your time in Cyrodiil. Because because this will make it harder to knock you off your mounts in that PVP zone. But really, all you need to know is at level 10, you unlock your mounts and all you have to do to get on it is press H if you're on PC. I'm not sure what the mount button is on console and that'll pull your mounts out. And once you have a mount equipped, it should automatically equip. If it doesn't, for some reason, you can go into your menu, your collections menu, and then click on your mounts and you will have the Sorrel Horse unlocked. This is the first mount you get. It's nice, basic mount, exactly kind of what you would expect to start with. Nothing flashy, you know, a standard horse. And then down the road, you can unlock or purchase much fancier ones if you're inclined to do so or not. It's up to you. The important thing is that you come here once a day and you upgrade that mount, get the mount speed up so that it doesn't feel so slow every time you get on the mount. The other thing you should spend gold on while you're leveling is upgrading your bags. Right now, my character can hold 210 items at once. 140 of that is from upgrading my bags. You start out being able to hold 60 items, which you're gonna realize fills up really fast. When you're running dungeons, when you're collecting things in the game, you will fill up that 60 item bag really, really fast. So it's very important to upgrade those bags as soon as possible. Basically, all your gold at the beginning is gonna go to upgrading your bags. This is the most worthwhile thing that you will spend your gold on ever right so don't feel bad don't feel sad that oh man all my gold's going to my bags this is something you will use for the rest of your character's career it's not a waste of money you need to do it and you might as well do it right at the beginning so look for the pack merchant in the zone of your choice if you hover over these symbols in your zone you'll find one that says pack merchant in blackwood it's right here you can see there it says pack merchant yaxi tool so if you come over to him You'll be able to open up this menu and he'll say, hey, I need a couple thousand gold and I'll increase the size of your bag. Initially, your bag will be able to hold 60 items. Once you upgrade it, it'll be able to hold 10 more and you can upgrade it 10 slots at a time all the way until it can hold 140 slots. Uh, so you can get up to 140 slots by upgrading your bag here at the pack merchant. Then you can add another 60 slots to that at the stable master by upgrading your mount. And then there's 10 additional slots that you can purchase in the crown store by purchasing a specific type of pet. 
If you're interested in doing that, the pets are the Bristleneck Warbore and the Mournhold Packrat. These will add five slots each to your entire account. So every one of your characters will get an additional five slots of inventory for each one that you have. This is by no means required or even necessary, but if you've got the extra crowns lying around, and your inventory space is already full, these can be nice to have. And remember, there's a pack merchant in every major town. Just look for the symbol that has a pack merchant on it and go find him. Okay, so those are the first two things you should do at level 10. Now there's one more incredibly important thing to do at level 10, and that is go to Cyrodiil. Now PVEers, hear me out, there's not going to be any PVP involved in this quest. You're just going to go to Cyrodiil and you're going to do the zone story. It's a PVE quest and we're only going to do the first phase of it. And that's going to get us to Alliance level three. So we'll have Assault three, which will unlock this passive right here, Continuous Attack. And if you're a stamina tune, it's also going to unlock Vigor at Alliance level one, which is essential for any stamina tune in this game. This is the single best self heal for stamina tunes presently in Elder Scrolls Online. You get that at Assault level one and you get Continuous Attack at level three. Continuous attack adds a flat 30% increase to your move speed when you're on your mount when you put one skill point into it. Every single character in this game should have this passive. That is a massive increase in your speed. Trust me, the second you put the point in this passive and you get on your mount, you'll be praising the heavens, thanking the gods that you listened to Lucky and went and got this one right away. It's going to make you move so much faster, get everything done so much faster in this game. So to get there, all you're going to do is open up the alliance menu. That's pressing L on the keyboard. Then you're going to look for any low pop campaign in Cyrodiil. We don't want to go to one where there's a lock, right? If we can help it, because that means you're going to have to wait to get in there. Whereas if you pick one that's more or less empty, it's going to put you in there right away. So let's click on one and go in. Okay, so now you've landed in your faction's zone. The map of Cyrodiil is broken into three factions. <laughs> Currently, AD owns this entire map, ironically. AD is yellow, Aldmeri Dominion, DC is blue, Daggerfall Covenant, and then I am on the EP faction up here. On this instance of Cyrodiil, we own uh, just about nothing, which is okay. That's not going to impact what we need to do here. None of that is important because this quest that we need to do is the PVE portion of this instance. So what you'll do is you'll open up your map and then you'll click open zone guide, and then you'll click start zone story. When you do that, it's going to show you where the zone story is that you pick up. There's going to be a couple of guys with zone story markers over their head here. You want to do the zone story that asks you to do stuff within the this zone it's going to ask you to teleport to the other starting base for your faction every faction has two starting bases that cannot be taken by the enemy this one here and this one here for ep if you're ad it's these bottom two and then if you're dc it is these far to left that is why ad has taken pretty much everything except those right ad could take this one and this one if they wanted to but they could never take these two back zones which is why no matter what's going on on the map we're not going to be affected by whatever ad is doing here or the other factions so you're going to pick the quest up then it's going to tell you to go to the other one and then maybe it's going to tell you to go back to the one you started at and ultimately it's going to teach you how to use a ballista a catapult right go through that quest when it asks you if you want to skip your training say no make sure you do not choose go through the dialogue on the zone story very carefully if you spam you might skip through it and when you finish this quest you won't get all of the same amount of ap you'll only be level two in the alliance and instead of level three which means you won't unlock this passive right here you'll have to go do a battlegrounds or two to get the missing ap in order to get this passive which isn't the end of the world it's just an extra step that you didn't have to take so there you go you just come to the zone you open the zone guide you click start zone story and you follow it until you go do your catapult training and then turn in that quest at which point you will have alliance level three if you open up your skill point menu and you don't see uh anything under the alliance if assault and support aren't showing up make just click on any line any guild line and then boom this menu will expand right here and these will be added for some reason you have to do that i don't know why the first time you unlock a skill line you just have to click on any other skill line and then when you're in the menu and these will pop up or the skill line that you added will be added to the menu and it should be level three alternatively if all of this sounds way too complicated you could just simply queue for battlegrounds a few times if you don't mind doing a little pvp until you get alliance level three and that would also unlock these things for you okay so to recap level 10 we started doing our random daily dungeons we also started upgrading our mounts daily because we unlocked a mount at level 10. The mount is given to you as a level up reward, so you will receive it when you hit level 10. It'll just automatically appear in your character's collections. We also came here to Cyrodiil to get our Alliance level three so that we get the 30% increased move speed while we're on our mount, right? 
the quest takes maybe five minutes and perhaps maybe 10 minutes if you've never done it before, right? The first time you're kind of fumbling around looking for where you're supposed to go next. One very important thing about doing quests in this game that is worth noting is if you're doing a quest, if you click on the quest you're doing, like for instance, if I clicked on this quest in Rivenspire and I press M after you click on it, open up your map from this screen, right? Make sure your journal's open, click on the quest you wanna do, then click map. And the map will go directly to where that quest is located. You can zoom out and you can see, oh, I need to go to Rivenspire and then it's here in the south of Rivenspire. Same thing in Cyrodiil. When you're doing this quest in Cyrodiil, click on the quest, right? And then click M. It will show you in Cyrodiil where you need to go, right? Whether it's up here or here, or if it's in the same instance as you. And it's probably gonna ask you to go to the shrine, right? And teleport to the other starting base, just so you know how the teleportation system in Cyrodiil works. It's basically a little tutorial on that. Uh, the sum of it is you can teleport anywhere there's a green line connecting. If the line is connected, you can teleport to that place. If there's no line connected to it, you can't. This is under attack, so the line is gone. Even though we own it, you can't teleport there. The line is here, we could teleport here, we could even teleport here. And yellow, we can see their line is connected all the way around. They can teleport all the way up here, all the way over here, all the way over here. The line is not connected to this one for yellow, so they wouldn't be able to teleport to this base, likely because our team stole the resources around it. And if all three resources are owned by an opposing team, then you lose the ability to teleport to that keep, even though you own the ones next to it. Okay, but we won't go too deep into all of that here right now. Just know that if you press J and you click on the quest, then you press M, it's going to show you where you need to go next. Very, very handy requesting in Elder Scrolls Online, if not essential. After you've done these things, now you can continue doing all the dungeons if you want. You can queue up for any dungeon that you have unlocked. You could do Fungal Grotto five times if you enjoy it, or you could do Spindle Clutch and Fungal Grotto, or you could go do Banished Cells. And then as you level up, you'll unlock more and more of these dungeons. Down here, the DLC dungeons are going to start at Black Drake Villa being the first DLC dungeon on the list. And you'll notice that at this point, the dungeons start going alphabetically. These are the DLC dungeons. These are the dungeons that have been added later in the game. They are harder. You can't do these until you get to level 45 on normal difficulty. And in veteran, you can't do them until you hit level 300 CP. So you won't be able to do these until 45. These will unlock as you're approaching 45. And I highly encourage you to do every single one of them at least one time. Running them is going to do things like fill out your collections. And whenever you find gear in there and then you deconstruct it, it's going to be added to your collections menu, right? And anything in this menu, you can craft later on. So if that set ends up being a set you need because the build calls for it and you've already found that gear and deconstructed it, well, guess what? Now you could craft that gear, right? So dungeons are so important to run because so many of these sets, so many of these monsters, helmets are going to become essential so many of these gear sets are going to be essential for making your character stronger you know the meta is going to constantly change and you never know which set Zoss is going to buff next and bring into relevance and uh, you'll be really happy if you've already collected a bunch of that set and you can just go craft it at a crafting station on a whim for more information on how to use the transmute station to craft gear as i'm describing be sure to check out my complete beginner's guide and just click on the timestamp that says transmutation station Again, I'll have that complete beginner guide linked in the description below so you can listen to it after this if you want while you're playing the game just to kind of absorb some more of this more in-depth knowledge. Oh, one other thing that's worth noting is that while you're here in Cyrodiil, there's going to be two zone quests that you could do, right? Which is a little confusing because one of them when you press J and then you press M, right? It's actually going to take you to this zone here, Imperial City. One of these zone quests is going to try to take you to Imperial City. You don't want to do that one. You can go ahead and abandon that quest. Just right click on it and click abandon and that'll get it rid of it for you if you happen to pick that one up. That's a detour you don't need to take right now. You can do that at some other time if you want, but it's not going to be the most efficient way to get yourself up to level three in Alliance. And you'll be happy to know this is everything for level 10 through level 45. There's nothing new that you need to worry about adding into your routine between 10 and 45. Just make sure you do your random normal dungeons, do your mount upgrades, your deconstructing gear to level up your benches. You've got your abilities on your bar. Remember, keep one of these abilities from each of these skill lines so that you're leveling all three of these up so that they all get to 50 and you get to take advantage of all of the passives lying within. And then when all three are 50, you can take those abilities off and only slot the abilities that your build is calling for. Make sure you're upgrading your bag anytime you have enough money to do so. And then once you get to level 15, you're going to unlock your back bar. You can see here I can switch between my front bar 
in my back bar. The important thing to know is that level 15, you will unlock that back bar, which means in your inventory, you'll need to put a weapon back there. Until you get an arena weapon, you're going to wear whatever set you're wearing on the front bar. So if your front bar weapon is Medusa, your back bar weapon will be Medusa as well. If your front bar weapon is Julianos, your back bar weapon will be Julianos. And then when you get your Maelstrom Staff or your Maelstrom Bow or your BRP Daggers, right, you'll put those back here later on. But that's way down the road. That's probably CP 160 plus before you need to worry about that. And that's going to be everything that you need to worry about until level 45. At level 45, you need to make sure you have finished that Undaunted quest you picked up at level 10. Remember that quest? It said go into Spindle Clutch or if you picked it up in a different zone, it might have said go to Fungal Grotto or something else, right? You need to make sure you went and you did that quest and you turned it in because that's going to allow you to do pledges. You're going to want to do pledges every day starting at level 45. In order to do pledges, you will want to go to your faction zones. That would be either Stormhaven, Rotwood, or Deshaun. It doesn't matter which one you go to. This is not locked by your region anymore. Just make sure you go turn in the quest where you picked it up. And then after that, you can go and do your pledges at any of these places. As an example, I'll go pick them up right now. So you know what that looks like. I'm going to port to Stormhaven, um, which is a good time to explain how to get out of Cyrodiil. OK, you cannot simply leave Cyrodiil. There is no easy way to get out of this place. What you have to do is go to the shrine here, right? Not to be confused. See, there's this shrine here on the map. This is not the same as the one here that you use. There's two shrines in Cyrodiil. One is to leave Cyrodiil. That's this one that has your typical shrine symbol. There's the one here that you use to teleport from one base to another. OK, so there's two types of shrines. Make sure you come to the right one when it's time to leave. This is the only way out of here. So you're going to click on it and then zoom out. Now you can see the entire world's map and you can pick where you want to go. We want to go to Stormhaven and we want to go to Wayrest because this is the city, the faction city that has ledges, or at least it's one of the three. You can go to Wayrest in Stormhaven or Mournhold in Deshaun or you can go to Elden Root in Grotwood. Once you've finished the Undaunted quests that we talked about earlier, when you come to these people, you'll be able to talk to them all and they'll have you talk to every one of these once and then eventually these blue arrows will be over their heads and you'll be able to pick up your pledges. But we'll talk to all of them and we'll pick up pledges. Pledges are a lot of fun. Basically what they say to do is go to these places Fungal Grotto, right, is one. Moon Hunter Keep is another. And Selene's Web is the last one for today. Pledges change every day, and every player in the game has the same list of pledges every day. So if you and your friend come pick these up on the same time, you will get these same pledges, and you can do them together. If you don't do them today, you can go do them tomorrow and turn them in, but you might have different pledges than someone who picks them up tomorrow. If you want to have the same pledges as someone who picks them up tomorrow, just abandon them all. Just right-click, abandon and then pick them up again tomorrow. And now you'll have the same pledges as the person you want to run pledges with. But let's talk about why we're doing pledges. There's two very important things that you get from doing pledges. One is it's going to level up your Undaunted Guild. Every pledge that you do is going to give you 25 points when you turn it in towards leveling up your Undaunted Guild. So this is a great way to expedite the leveling of the Undaunted Guild. So grab a friend or you can just queue up for it randomly with a pug group by clicking on the dungeon you want to do. Fungal Grotto was one of them. One of my add-ons tells me what the dailies are. So don't mind that. Yours won't have that unless you've picked up my add-ons and turned on that option. So if you don't see this blue text and these check marks, don't worry about that. That's my add-ons, right? Just know you look at your quest log, Fungal Grotto. So you'd come here, you'd queue up for Fungal Grotto, join the queue, and when you complete it, you'll be able to come back and turn in the quest to one of these NPCs. When you turn it in, they're going to give you some transmutes and some keys, an undaunted key. That's this currency right here. Undaunted keys. I have 29 of them. And these are very important because almost every build in the game is going to take advantage of monster sets, right? Monster sets are two piece sets that are insanely powerful. They're powerful for two reasons. One, they have some of the strongest one piece bonuses in the game. If we look at the monster set that I'm wearing right now, I'm only wearing one piece of it, the helmet. It adds 771 crit chance. That is a massive bonus to get for wearing of one piece of a set, right? If I wore both pieces, I would gain minor berserk at all times, increasing my damage down by 5%. That's a nice two piece bonus in certain types of content where your healer is not giving you that buff already. Essentially, the thing to know about monster sets is the helmet drops in the dungeon that that monster resides in. So Slime Craw is the name of the boss that this helmet is modeled after. And so I would have to run way Rest one on veteran to get this helmet to drop. The final boss will drop the helmet regardless of which boss it's named after. And it always drops anytime you run that dungeon on veteran. 
the way you get the second piece, which is always the shoulder piece, right? The second piece would be the shoulder. So if I look here, slime craw, here's the second one, right? It's a shoulder piece. I can put it here. Now I have the two piece bonus. The way you get this is using your undaunted keys that we were just talking about, okay? From doing these pledges, you get one undaunted key from doing a pledge on normal difficulty right? But if you queue for that same pledge on veteran difficulty, you activate the hard mode fight on the final boss, you will now get two keys. But don't worry about doing pledges on veteran until you're after 160 and you have your five piece sets on. Okay, don't go into veteran until you're 160. It's a waste of your time, probably won't even have five piece sets on unless someone crafted you some gear. And even still without any champion points, I mean, there's just, there's not really any reason to be here ahead of schedule. Uh, the game will allow you to start queuing up for veteran content at 50, but trust me, it's not worth it. Just wait until 160 and you have your five piece sets. You can gather your five piece sets in normal. It's the exact same gear that drops in normal and veteran content. There's no benefit to coming here. You just have to come here once you want your monster helmet because it only drops in veteran. Okay, so stick with normal until you're 160 and you have your five piece sets that you're wearing. Then start queuing up for veteran stuff. Try that out. See how it feels. So in summary, at 45, you're going to start doing your pledges. And when you do a pledge on normal, you get one key when you do it on veteran and you activate hard mode you'll get two keys if you do veteran and you don't activate hard mode you still get one key veteran dlc dungeons are incredibly difficult and they're going to be nearly impossible for you when you're low level to do the hard mode version of it so don't be shy about doing perhaps maybe veteran fungal grotto and veteran selene's web right do these two on veteran and then do the dlc pledge on normal to get the one key here right so then you can get a total of five keys that day without beating your head against the wall trying to get that one extra key for the veteran dlc hard mode dungeon right these are pretty difficult so the first time you go in there don't be surprised if you find yourself dying a lot and perhaps not even able to get through the dungeon all right now you started doing that at 45 now you're level 50 and the champion points are introduced to the game the champion points start raining in on you right my character is cp level champion point level 1537 you can get up to a total of 3600 champion points now, I know that number sounds massive. It is. And it's going to take a long time for the average person to get that many points. I've been playing this game nonstop for over two years, and I've only got 1,500. Granted, they did just make it a lot easier. The cap used to be 810. Now it's 3,600. And so when they changed that, they also made it way easier to get champion points, which is helping newer players catch up faster. It's great for new players. At this point, the champion point menu is perhaps the most confusing part of this game for new players. They open it up, they look at all the nodes, and they really them and their eyes kind of glaze over like uh which one do i want do i want to increase my critical damage or do i want to increase my critical damage when i'm standing behind the enemy or do i want to do more damage with my dots right you can guess you can come in here and you can guess randomly or you can follow one of my builds or one of anybody else's builds that tells you what order to put your champion points into which nodes so that you're not guessing so that you can confidently put these in here until later on when you understand them better and that's kind of what i recommend to do if you're a new player and these are stressing you out just open up one of my build guides even if you're not following the build uh the champion point spec should be more or less the same even if you're doing your own builds right the champion points that i tell you to put in and the order that i tell you to put them in will be 99 percent accurate for your build however if you want to go ahead and just guess and pick the nodes that you think sound cool you know go for it and have fun uh just know that your character could end up considerably weaker if you're not choosing the right nodes for your character i'll put a link to my builds in the description below again so that if you're looking for where to respect you can do that there and i go into much more detail about which nodes to invest in and why in that guide okay so at level 50 we've got the champion points coming in and they come in fast that first random dungeon you do will give you easily 10 champion points all by itself right these first champion point levels go so fast you can get 50 in a day easy no problem when you first hit cp level so what should you be focusing on at this point well I would focus on getting to CP 160 because at 160, you've hit max gear level. If I look at my gear, you'll notice all of my gear is CP 160. Even though I'm CP 1537, my gear is level 160. That is the highest level gear goes in this game. And that is very unlikely to change unless Zoss completely reworks the gear system. It has been 160 for a very long time and they're definitely never going to increase it. The only thing they might do is change the way that the system works completely, like a complete overhaul. But for now, 160 is the max. So when you get to 160, it's time to start grabbing your gear or crafting it. If you've already found it, you know, if you found it at 
like level 15, now you need to craft yourself a CP160 version of that gear at the transmute station and get yourself five pieces of gear, right? You want to have at least two five piece sets on maybe a mythic item or a two piece set instead and an arena weapon on the back bar. This is a pretty typical setup, right? Two five piece sets, usually one five piece set is on the jewelry and the front bar. Another five piece set is on the body and then the head and the shoulder will be the monster set. I'm only wearing a one piece monster set because I'm wearing a mythic item. This is one of those items you can take out of the ground because of the antiquity system you picked up earlier and they are the most powerful one piece items in the game, but you can only wear one at a time and they're oftentimes very niche like this one that I'm wearing right now. It's only effective if nothing is attacking me, so I would never wear this while soloing, but in a dungeon where my tank has control of the boss and all of the ads, I can probably get away with wearing this for increased damage for my character. And while you're working your way to 160 to get that gear, you want to be leveling up your guilds, all of the guilds you join. The Fighter's Guild, if you're a Stamina Tune, you should level this up. The Mage's Guild, you should be leveling up if you're a Magic Tune, so that's collecting lore books. You should be leveling up the Undaunted Guild by doing dungeons and pledges no matter what type of character you are, right? So level up these guilds. You can hover over this bar up at the top and that tells you how to level the guild if you ever forget. So make sure you're leveling your guilds, make sure you're leveling your weapon line, make sure you're leveling your class lines, right? And this is what you're doing on your way to 160 so that when you hit 160, you can focus on your gear. Make sure you're grabbing tons of sky shards, make sure you're grabbing lots of skill points in all the various ways you can grab skill points in the game. And if you've done that, by the time you hit 160, the second you get those five piece sets on, your character is gonna be devastatingly strong. It will be so much stronger and the five piece sets you put on will be so much more powerful if you have your passives unlocked, if you've grabbed your skill points on the way, if you've leveled up these guilds on the way, that's all really gonna pay off. And at 160, you're really gonna start to become a force to be reckoned with. So at 160, you get that gear. And if you're interested in group content, it really opens up for you now. You can start queuing up for veteran dungeons and getting the veteran dungeon achievements. You can start doing veteran pledges. You can start doing all of the trials in the game. Ethereum Archives, Hellraw Citadel, Sanctum of Fidia, Mott, Florcage, Halls of Fabrication, Asylum Sanctorum, Cloud Rest, Sunspire, Kynes Aegis. There's tons of trials in this game. They're all incredibly fun. There's tons of gear in there. And some of that gear is best in slot gear for a ton of different builds. If you're following a build guide, it's likely that at some point it's going to ask you to go into one of these trials and collect some of that gear. So consider jumping into these trials at CP160. I will put a link in the description below on how to get into trials and when. I have an entire YouTube video dedicated to that topic alone. Once you get to CP300, you will unlock the veteran DLC dungeons. You can start queuing up for these in the dungeon finder now that you're CB300 and inside of these dungeons are some really fun things. You've got skins and personalities. You've got dyes. There's tons of really awesome cosmetics tucked into these dungeons for getting various achievements such as simply clearing the dungeon on veteran will give you a skin sometimes or or getting the hard mode, the no death and the speed run achievements will give you a personality or sometimes a skin, right? These are really fun and there's really awesome cosmetics in here. Uh, I can't recommend it enough to start trying to get them once you hit CB 300. And again, I'll put the guides on how to get those skins and those personalities in the description below so that you know which ones are the easiest to get, which ones are the hardest to get. And I guarantee you there's some that you can get right now that you don't even need to be CP 300 to get you just have to teleport into a certain zone and you'll unlock a personality so i'll link that in the description below from 300 on the world is really your oyster you can start doing your veteran arenas your veteran dungeons your veteran trials really anything that you feel qualified to do and and at this point the guides have to be a lot more specific and they have to be tailored to what you want to do. But as far as the path to CP300 goes, these are more or less the items you absolutely don't want to miss. And we've grabbed them in an order that allows them all to kind of passively level up. You got your companion right away. So it was leveling up, it was getting gear. And when you were doing Mage's Guild quests or Undaunted quests, you were leveling up your companion's Mage's Guild or Undaunted Guild. And when you're opening treasure chests, you were getting gear for your companion, right? You picked up the Mage's Guild, you picked up the Undaunted Guild. So when you're getting those achievements, those were leveling up. When you picked up those lore books, those were leveling up. Those two are retroactive, however. So if you forgot to pick them up early and you pick them up later, that experience will be retroactively applied as far as achievements and lore books go. However, I don't believe that's the case for pledges and any experience you would have got 
for those. So don't forget to pick up the Undaunted Guild. As for the Fighter's Guild, you need to make sure to pick that one up early because it, that experience is not retroactively applied if you forgot to pick it up. So pick it up right away. From there, you started your daily tasks like upgrading your mounts, upgrading your bags, doing your random daily dungeons and your random daily battlegrounds, and eventually your daily pledges. There's not that many things that you have to do, and whatever you do in addition to those things each day is totally up to you. There's no right or wrong way to play Elder Scrolls Online, I can't emphasize that enough. The important thing is that you're doing the things that you find fun. Don't let anyone try to make this game so efficient for you that it takes all the fun out of the game. At that point, it's just a matter of time until you quit. So make sure to do the stuff that's fun to you. Make sure to focus on the things that you enjoy most, whether that's questing or whether it's dungeons, or if it's PvP, then get in there and PvP. Just under Understand that if you grab some of these things sooner than later, they'll be able to level the entire time you're doing all the stuff that you find fun. And that's all there is for this video, guys. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing so that you can get alerted to more of my ESO content. And if you ever want to hang out with someone else who loves ESO, swing by my stream over at twitch.tv slash lucky ghost. I'll put links to that in the description below as well. And finally, I'd like to thank my YouTube members for supporting the channel by becoming members. To find out how to become a member of this channel, and what the perks are, click the join button below. As always, I hope you have a fantastic day, night, or evening, wherever you might be, and I hope to see you in the next video.